financial aid and I'll give a, a little bit of information about how financial aid um, works here at Reed College. So uh, my name is Sandy Sundstrom and I am the Director of Financial Aid um, here at Reed. So I'm going to share uh, with you a uh, uh, PowerPoint, um, and then I do want to have time to answer any questions that you have um, at the end of the program. So I think I'll go through these slides. Um, and um, if you'd like to save your questions for the end, um, that's great. Or if um, while I'm speaking, if you want to go ahead and put them in the chat, um, I can uh, attempt to answer those questions um, as we're going through the, the presentation. Or if you want to just privately chat one to me if it's not something that um, you care to share with, with the room, um, then you can do that as well. And we'll try to get back with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started um, sharing my Oh my gosh, I am so sorry, everybody. <laughs> Sharing the screen is not the same as leaving a meeting. I'm gonna blame it on my first COVID vaccine. I had it yesterday and I think I have like COVID vaccine brain fog. We'll go with that. Um, so trying it again, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, All right, I think we are in business. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, again, financial, uh, financial aid fundamentals. Let's get started here. So some of the things we're gonna talk about, we're gonna go through what financial aid is exactly, the definition of that, um, the timeline, when you can expect to complete an application from the time you complete the application to finding out um, how much financial aid you're eligible to receive. We'll talk about the different um, types of financial aid that you might be offered, where that money comes from, um, a little bit about how to apply, um, how schools will determine the aid that you're eligible to receive. We'll talk a little bit about net price calculators. If you haven't explored those yet, that's a really good thing, especially as you're starting this journey. Um, and then we'll talk about special circumstances, things that happen in families' financial situations that doesn't maybe fit very neatly on a financial aid application and how to communicate those special circumstances to um, the various financial aid offices. And then again, um, wanting to have time for questions at the end. Okay, so financial aid defined, uh, it really is what it sounds like it is. It's money used to help pay for your college expenses. And that might be aid in the form of a grant or a scholarship or student work or work study um, or a student loan. And we're gonna break all of those down for you in just a minute. So looking quickly at the timeline, um, you're going to apply for admission to various colleges. And about the same time, you're also going to be completing the financial aid applications. So you might see that the school, all schools are going to require um, the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. If you're applying for aid at that school need-based aid, they'll require that. Some schools may require an additional application, you know, their own institutional application, or perhaps something called the CSS profile. Um, not all colleges require that. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, and so you've applied for admission, you've applied for financial aid, then you are notified of your admission decision. And if you've been admitted to that school, applied for financial aid, then, um, Shortly thereafter, you're going to receive your um, notification of your financial aid eligibility. So just to give you a little idea of the order of things and how they might um, work for you. Um, 
So the categories of financial aid, um, two main categories. There's aid that's based on your financial need, and then there's aid that's not based on need. So need-based aid is the aid that um, we work with in financial aid offices. This is financial assistance provided to um, students based on their financial information. Where non-need-based aid uh, has nothing to do with the amount of money you make, how many people are in your household, how many people are going to college. It's strictly based on things that aren't affected by need, such as uh, merit scholarship. So maybe it's a college that offers um, scholarships based on your high school GPA or athletics or music or different talents, things like that, things that are not associated with um, your financial information. So those are kind of the, the two main buckets of aid that you might see colleges offering. And uh, the types of aid that you might see. Um, grants um, and scholarships, the two that you see um, on the left side of your screen are considered gift aid. So they would be uh, money that you don't need to repay. Where loans and student work are still considered um, sources of financial aid, but student work, you need to work and earn the funding in order to receive it. And then the loan is um, of course funding that you would borrow and need to repay. All of those components could come together to form uh, your financial aid eligibility at a particular college. So breaking it down a little bit more, um, grants, again, gift aid, money that does not need to be repaid. Those are typically awarded based on your financial need where scholarships are typically awarded on the basis of merit, or again, a special skill or talent um, leadership, music, um, it depends upon what the particular college offers. Um, and some colleges offer merit scholarships, some do not. Um, some award aid strictly based on demonstrated need and do not award merit. And Reed is one of those colleges. All of the financial aid that we um, award uh, institutionally at Reed um, is awarded based on a student's um, financial situation. Loans, again, are uh, monies that uh, students and or parents um, can borrow to help pay for their educational expenses. There's federal loan programs available to students and parents and um, students, even though you have no uh, credit record, credit history probably, credit worthiness test score, um, you're eligible to borrow a loan through the federal government um, simply because you're enrolled in a degree seeking program at a college. So you don't need to get co-signer for that or have it run through a credit check or anything. Uh, you're eligible to borrow through those federal loan programs. Parents, there's also a loan program available to uh, parents to, to borrow. And then there are um, also private loans. Uh, we always caution students, of course, on the debt that they're taking on. Uh, so if you are borrowing loans to help finance your education, we always um, encourage students to look at your federal loans first, lower interest rates, more deferment options, uh, income sensitive repayment and programs like that, where private loans um, don't typically have um, those benefits associated with them. And then the last type of financial aid that you might see is student work or work study. Um, and that is a program that allows students to work typically on campus and earn money to help uh, cover their educational costs. So where does the money come from? Um, let's start with private. Um, the private sources could be um, private scholarships or outside scholarships. So I think most of you are juniors, so it's a little early to be looking at private scholarships, but these are um, scholarships that students find um, outside of the colleges that they're applying to. Um, they're through um, civic organizations, religious organizations, um, any organization that provides uh, private scholarships um, or outside scholarships, students can apply to those um, um, institutions and determine if they're going to be eligible for any of those sources of aid. 
Um, there are a lot of private um, websites, search sites out there for private scholarships, and you can you know, certainly look at those. If you do end up at a site, though, that is asking you to pay money, they want your credit card information, just exit out of there, don't do that. They're, they really aren't going to find you any outside scholarship that's not available through any kind of a free resource. Um, but I have found that the best uh, source for students is actually their high school um, guidance office. Your guidance counselor is familiar with the scholarships that other students at your school um, may have received in the past. Um, they're typically really good about sending out application reminders of scholarships that they're aware of. And, and that's where we find most of the students um, who receive those uh, resources um, do so through that um, through that source. So there, and there's also private loans that we talked about too, but um, in this case, private um, or outside scholarships fall into that bucket. Um, the state that you um, reside in may offer some state programs. Typically the programs that they offer are um, eligible to you if you attend a college in that state, but not always. So check your own um, state resources. Um, if you're an Oregon resident, you would look at the um, Oregon Student Access and Completion site. They have some information um, out there about the Oregon State Grant and um, Oregon, uh, they have a couple of Oregon merit-based scholarships as well. The federal government is the largest provider of funding for loan programs. So that is the, the greatest um, amount of money that comes from the federal government is to finance the federal loan programs. They also provide money to schools for um, the federal Pell Grant, the grant that uh, goes to the highest need um, students would may receive a federal Pell Grant. They also have a federal uh, work study program that provides um, student work dollars to different colleges. Um, but the majority of the funding that comes from the federal government is in the form of loans. Um, and then the institutions. Um, institutions themselves typically provide their own funding to students. And institutions are the largest provider of uh, the grants and the scholarships that um, students do receive. The college may also have its own. We, we at Reed um, get a small amount of money from the federal government for, for student work, but we also have an institutional um, work program. So students don't need to qualify for the federal work um, study because we, have, we award institutional dollars for that as well. But all of those sources of aid come together um, and form um, financial aid. All right, a little bit about how to apply. So FAFSA, I think a lot of people have heard of the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And this would be required um, by any college that you're applying to uh, for financial assistance. Uh, for domestic students. So I'm not sure if we have any international students um, on the call, but uh, you would not complete a free application for federal student aid. That would be for um, US citizens um, only. So FAFSA, if you're a domestic student, um, again, the CSS profile might be required. Um, you would go to the college's website to find out exactly what they um, require and when the due dates are. So that's something that you definitely want to do. Every college will list the requirements to apply for financial aid, and then they'll also tell you when they are due. So a little bit about um, the FAFSA, the FAFSA application. And again, when you do your application, um, the FAFSA, you're going to complete one FAFSA application and send it to all of the schools um, that you would like to have received that information. So you don't need to be admitted to the school. You don't even have to have applied to the school yet. You can list any school you want that you want to have um, this information sent to. So you'll provide information. Um, it is used, the data that you provide on your FAFSA is used to calculate um, something called the expected family contribution, which is really not the best name for that. In fact, in a couple of years, um, the government finally is going to be changing that 
to something else um, because it's confusing for families. That's not the dollar amount that you need to write out a check to the college. It's not what, um, what you're gonna owe at the end of the semester, anything like that. It's just really, it's an eligibility indicator. It tells the college if you're gonna get a Pell Grant or if um, the eligibility that you have for a federal loan. But basically it's collecting this information and then we use it here to determine your eligibility for federal, state, and maybe institutional funds, depending upon the college that you're applying to. Um, there's a lot more detail on for divorced or separated parents, but so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But essentially you're gonna report if your parents are divorced or separated, you're going to report the information for the parent um, that you lived with the most uh, during the past 12 months. Um, and if that's the same, then there's a whole other, then you're going to go with the parent that provided the most financial support. But that's all outlined for you on the application. You don't need to worry about that at this point. So you're going to complete your FAFSA, and then you're going to sign that electronically using um, something called uh, an FSA ID. Um, Parents, if you've already completed a FAFSA for one of your other children, you're going to continue to use that FSA ID. You use the same one for all your children. And um, students, you'll need to get an FSA ID at some point um, in order to sign your FAFSA. Um, for sure. And then um, once you enroll in college and um, perhaps you borrow a student, a federal student loan, you'll use it to complete your loan paperwork, check on the balance of your loan when you go into repayment and that sort of thing. So those are just some of the steps that you'll do with um, completing a FAFSA application. And then again, if the college requires the CSS profile, um, then they will inform you of that and provide you with the information you need to do that. Now, it may be um, required by some colleges and universities. It's uh, typically going to be required at a more selective private college um, who will award quite a bit in their own institutional dollars. Um, families that use this, or families, colleges that use the CSS profile um, typically do so because it allows us to get a lot more information than what a FAFSA can tell us about a family's true financial picture. Um, there's a lot more information. It does take longer to complete a CSS profile than a FAFSA, but it really does um, allow the family to give us more information about uh, not only what um, their income looked like two years ago, what was it last year? What is this year looking like for you? Um, especially in the time of COVID, you know, when you're applying to college, you're reporting the information from two years prior. So a lot could have changed in that time span. So we like to use the profile for that to give us a, a better idea of what's been happening for a family. There's also a place for you to tell us about your special circumstances, some additional expenses um, that you might be incurring uh, that you really don't have a place to um, indicate on a FAFSA application. Um, and then just a little bit different from the FAFSA, if it's a CSS profile, uh, typically colleges are going to require that both parents, regardless of their marital status, that both parents complete um, a CSS profile. There is a fee for the CSS profile. Um, however, based on the information that's being reported, um, low-income students can qualify for a waiver and will not need to um, pay a fee. So, um, and, and like the FAFSA, the CSS profile, you'll complete one application and you can list all the schools that you want to have receive that information. So it's sent electronically to those various schools. So we got FAFSA, we got CSS profile. Um, the first day that the application will be available to you will be October 1st. Um, and that's the date that the FAFSA application and the CSS profile application, if it's required, um, can be completed for the upcoming academic year. So, that's great for you to know that October 1 is the first day that it's available, but what's really important is um, to look at the college's websites to find out what their priority uh, financial aid application deadlines are. So for instance, at Reed, uh, for regular decisions, students, we would want them to complete 
their CSS profile and uh, FAFSA application by um, January 15th. So there's some lag time in there. Um, but, but again, it's really important that you um, find out what the deadlines are at each of the colleges so you don't miss, miss out on an opportunity because you missed a deadline. But they are out there starting on October 1st. Um, and then what happens is um, the student applies for admission, they've applied for financial aid, uh, and I'm going to talk about need-based aid um, at this point, just backing up a little bit to merit scholarships. Those decisions are typically made in the admission office um, while they're evaluating the student for admissibility. They're, if it's an academic scholarship, they may be looking at it um, through that lens as well and making merit scholarship determinations. If it's a school that offers a music scholarship, perhaps there's an audition or there's something else that the student needs to complete. So all of those non-need-based things are happening either in admission or maybe other departments across campus. But just focusing for um, now on the need-based side of it, student is admitted, um, admissions notifies us, they've completed their financial aid applications. So then um, we in the financial aid office um, want to put together a financial aid package for that student. So the first thing we have to do is determine their um, financial need. And we do that by looking at how much the college costs, how much it costs to attend for one year. We subtract from that what the family is expected to contribute based on their information. And um, that leaves us with their demonstrated financial need. So breaking it back to the cost of attendance, um, we all know about the tuition fees, you know, room and board if you're living on campus, those are called direct costs. Those are something that we look at, that's like your billable cost when you get a, a bill in the fall for the fall or in the summer for the fall semester, it's gonna list your tuition, your fees, room and board um, if you live on campus. But there are other costs that we want to look at when we're calculating financial aid. Um, we want to look at how, you know, you have to buy books, you have to purchase your supplies, transportation, depending upon if you're going across the country to go to college, you're going to have a higher transportation cost than if you're going in state. Personal living expenses, you're going to need to buy your shampoo and some toothpaste and things like that. Um, and then if you're living off campus, if you're paying rent and you're buying groceries, um, those are expenses as well. So we want to look at that when we're calculating need. We combine those direct and the indirect costs, and that forms the cost of attendance. So of course, that's going to vary widely from college to college. If you're looking at a four-year private school, a state school, and maybe a two-year school, they're going to have very different cost of attendance. And then the other part of that calculation is that family contribution. Um, and again, that's a, a measurement of a family's ability to pay for college. Uh, it's a federal formula that colleges are going to use across the board. It's going to stay the same regardless of how much the college costs. And what it will consider, there's a lot going into the FAFSA, but the, the main drivers of that family contribution are um, the parent and the student income. It's always going to look at that. It looks at um, household members, how many people are in the household. For, for now, it looks at the number of children in college. Um, starting in the 2023-24 academic year, um, they're taking out the children in college uh, part of the equation. But for now, it looks at the number of children that the family has in college. And it's going to look at student assets. So it always looks at that. Um, it might look at parent assets. Um, that's an it depends type thing uh, based on parent income. If the income is um, at a lower point, um, it totally ignores all assets from the formula. Um, it's also important, I think, for families to realize that when it's looking at parent assets, it is not looking at um, the value of your home, your home equity is excluded and it doesn't look at the value of your retirement accounts. So those are not considered assets in the federal aid calculation. Um, it's looking at cash, savings, checking, um, investments, 529s, that sort of thing. Those are considered um, uh, assets in the federal formula. 
and it doesn't look at there's no place for you to tell the FAFSA about how much your mortgage is or if you have consumer debt or anything like that. That's not part of um, the calculation. But that gives you an idea of some of the things that are um, that go into that that number. And as an example, if you're looking at a, a cost of um, four different types of institutions, let's say um, private college with a cost of 65,000, a four-year public, 26,000, maybe a community college at 13,000, and this sample student's family contribution, $10,000. So the student, this particular student needs about $3,000 more in order to attend community college, 16,000 uh, for a public four year, and then $55,000 to attend a private college. So uh, what the colleges are going to do is to attempt to meet as much of that financial need as possible. Um, if it's a school that says they meet 100% of demonstrated need, and let's look at the private college cost of 55,000. If the school meets full demonstrated need, they're going to come up with a financial aid package that meets that need or totals $55,000. Reed is a college who meets full um, demonstrated need. Um, there's only about 60 colleges across the country that um, meet demonstrated need. So if you're looking at a school who doesn't the, the college is then going to try to come as close to meeting that need as possible, but there, there may be a gap or an additional amount that the family needs to come up with in addition to um, the family contribution. So at this point, um, the best the best place I think, instead of really thinking about, I wonder what my EFC is, what my, my aid look like at that school, is to look at the colleges, think about the colleges that you might be interested in at this point and go to their website and look at their net price calculator. That's really the best way that you can get an estimate of what it might cost you to attend that college. Again, it's an estimate, um, but what it will tell you is what students in similar financial situations the year before what they received um, as far as grants or scholarships. So forgetting about that sticker price, that 65,000 or whatever we have on that slide, and then focusing on your net price. So what the net price calculator will do will give you that the sticker price, and then it'll tell you, it'll subtract from that what you qualify for in grants, grants or scholarships and it will be left, then you'll be left with your net price. And that's the cost that you want to look at. So these are really good tools. Every college is required to have one. So I would go out and look at those, um, give you a, a better idea of what you might pay for that college. It, it helps to kind of widen your choice of schools um, and to maybe not rule out a school just based solely on its um, sticker price. So definitely do that if you haven't had a chance to check out the net price calculator. Um, so back to our... Oh, sorry. Um, when you have applied for aid, you've been admitted, um, what you'll receive then from the financial aid office is something called an aid package, an award notification, an eligibility notification. They've got different names, but basically what it is, it's giving you the types and amounts of aid that you're eligible to receive. It's sent to the uh, student. Um, it might be an email, it might be in paper form in the mail. Um, at Reed, we do both. We know families are very anxious to get this information. So we send out an email uh, with the cost of a year at Reed. We show them what their financial aid is. Um, but then we also mail a packet to the home address so the family can sit down, parents can look at the information. Uh, we include more information about your net price, more information about loans, more information about um, student work on campus, that sort of thing. It usually comes right after you've been admitted. Um, and I would just say, make sure you look at them carefully. They're not all in the same format. Um, make sure that you understand. I think most colleges are pretty good at labeling. This is a grant. 
this is a scholarship, this is a loan, but just make sure that you understand that um, a loan is a loan before you go in and accept or do anything uh, with that. Make sure that you understand the information that's been provided to you. So look at those carefully. And then just real briefly before we get into questions, I wanted to talk about special circumstances. Um, they can be things like changes in income, changes in employment. We've definitely seen some of that in the last year. Um, unusually high medical expenses that aren't covered by insurance. Um, these are things that can't be documented on a FAFSA. You can tell the school a little bit more about it on your CSS profile if they require that. Um, but if you do have um, special circumstances, I would encourage you to reach out to um, the financial aid office at the various colleges that you're looking at and ask them what the best way is to let you let them know about the change in your circumstance. So we have families that will do that when they're applying for admission, they're applying for aid and something's happened and they want to let us know there's been a change since they filled out their aid applications. So we bring that in, we look at that, we review that. And then sometimes we get the financial aid package out to families and then something has happened in um, even between getting the package and um, making their deposit decision. So that then we wanna look at that again. So each college is gonna have a little bit different um, format for notifying um, them of that information. So do check in with them if you do have a change um, that has occurred after you've completed your applications. So that was a lot of talking very quickly, um, but I wanted to get through that to see um, what questions you all might have at this point. You in the chat. Um, so clarifying, yes, um, Reed does not offer any sort of merit aid. That is correct. Um, we are committed to meeting the full demonstrated need of students. Um, we wanna have a very broad socioeconomic um, diversity among the classes. So we want to make sure that students who could otherwise uh, not afford to attend, that we have the resources available to them. Um, how do private scholarships affect your financial aid? That's a really good question. And that's a good question that you want to ask. Um, each college could have a different policy on how they do that. Um, if it's a school that doesn't meet financial need, they're most likely going to just add that on to the financial aid package. But again, you have to check with them. If it's a school that does meet need and you have this new resource coming in, a new type of aid, there might need to be an adjustment that, that may need to be made in the financial aid package. So for example, at Reed, and this is outlined on our website for outside scholarships, at Reed we're meeting the full demonstrated need. So let's say a student comes in and they have a $2,000 scholarship from the Kiwanis Club. Um, we would, our policy would say that we're going to reduce the student work or the student loan. The student can decide which they prefer. So we would do that um, prior to reducing the read grant. So we always tell students outside scholarships, we're gonna look at reducing your grant, not your grant, we're gonna reduce your student work and we're gonna re reduce your student loan if we need to. And then if it's above and beyond that. So in our case, if a student brought in, let's say more than uh, $5,500 in outside scholarships, then we might have to look at reducing the read grant. The majority of students, there's probably maybe one a year that we have to um, reduce read grant because they've brought in so many outside uh, sources of aid. So usually we tell the student too and ask them if they can delay some of the scholarship for maybe their sophomore, junior year because a lot of scholarships are just for the first year. So we try to work with students before we have to make a read grant um, reduction. Mm -hmm. um, how, if someone isn't going to be on campus, can they still do work study? Um, no, you have to be enrolled degree seeking student at Reed in order to, um, to have a work study position. 
And a question about transfer students, if that looks different, um, it could depend on the school, but um, I can speak to read that no, um, because we're offering need-based aid, it doesn't matter if you apply as a transfer or regular decision incoming freshmen, our policies are the same for, for um, both admission programs. Um, question about international students, are they at a disadvantage if they are in great need? A financial aid. Um, it depends on the school. Um, if a, if they meet need, um, you're going to apply, and um, there wouldn't be a disadvantage. You, you'd have fi high financial need, perhaps, but um, the college would would award that accordingly. Um, some schools don't meet full financial need for international students, so that could be a disadvantage. I think. I think there might be more limited opportunities for, for full financial aid um, for international students, but than there are for domestic students, but there certainly are opportunities out there and you should check with the schools on what they offer. Um, question, oh, this is a good one. Question about financial aid offered guaranteed for the extent of the time a student is seeking a degree, is it valid for all four years? Um, so, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about merit scholarships. I'm glad you asked that question. Body Quest, um, great, great name there too. Um, merit scholarships, my, the institution I came from before coming to read offered merit scholarships. And there were some scholarships that had um, requirements that maybe it was a music scholarship and you had to stay in a certain orchestra in order to get that. Maybe it was a scholarship uh, based on academics, you might need to maintain a GPA to keep getting it. You might need to stay in a major in order to do it. So check on the merit. Um, Need-based aid, um, the colleges are going to strive to keep your aid package as consistent as possible. And that's what we do at Reed. However, if there is a big change um, in a family's financial situation, if there's been mostly a huge increase in their income or assets, then yes, there can be a change to the read grant, but it would have to be pretty significant. Um, it also goes the other way. If there's been a sharp decrease in income, um, then we wanna look at that as well. And in those cases, then we're going to um, offer additional assistance uh, for families who have fewer resources. But in general, um, we wanna keep it as consistent as possible. So question about admitted students, see their financial aid package, is it given out yet? Um, yes, um, any, all at Reed. Um, I think you're talking about Reed. Um, the aid packages are out and uh, there's a few students who we're still trying to do follow up with, they're missing some documents, but they're out. We send an email and then we also send um, uh, the financial aid packet into the home address. So if you haven't, if you're a current family and your student is admitted and you've applied for aid and you don't have anything yet, then contact the financial aid office um, and they can let you know right away um, what's happening with that. Um, question about bias or disadvantage against families with one stay at home parent. Um, no. Um, no, we're looking at, you know, there's no, there's no right or wrong um, situation like that. We look at income, we look at people in the household, we don't make judgments on who's doing what as far as profession or um, income. Hi. Um, the stu international students working off campus as US citizens have, um, they don't have as much flexibility in general to work off campus. I know here at Reed, our international students um, can only work on campus. So we make sure that we prioritize um, or give preference in some cases to international students who don't have any other options to work off campus. But we have, we have jobs for international students to do that. Um, does the FAFSA take into consideration educational expenses for other non-college dependents? Yes, it looks at number of people in the household, um, whether they're in college or not. And then if Reed doesn't offer merit scholarships, would 
do we do if financial aid doesn't give us enough? Um, you would uh, get your financial aid award to be based on your need if something has changed in your aid application. Um, in the, the data that you provided, you would want to let us know. We'd look at that um, and decide if, based on your request for reconsideration, we could offer additional need-based aid. Um, but we are a school that doesn't negotiate. Um, we don't, we wouldn't look at like a merit scholarship offer from another school and match that. Um, that's not, that's not what we do here. We go out with the strongest aid possible. We use, you know, consistent formula across families. Um, so, so yes, unless, unless there's been a change, then we definitely want to hear about that. We want to look into that to see if we can offer additional assistance. So. Oh my gosh, I've been talking a lot. And I think, did I, I think I answered them all. Um, did I miss anything? I don't think so. Um, anybody have any other last minute questions they wanna ask? Um, if you qualify for a non-custodial parent, waiver should you still list child support for income um so yes yeah, so the question is if it's you know a school that has a css profile and then both parents complete a profile application um there are cases where we're gonna um uh, waive that requirement um if there's uh you know deterioration breakdown of the the student and parent relationship we may choose to waive that contribution or the the requirement for that parent to complete that. But yes, the, the um, custodial parent should, it's, it's income, they would want to list, well, it's required that you list your child support um, on both the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Uh, the CSS profile is also gonna ask you when that support ends. So that's something that we consider when we're looking at um, financial aid packages as well. Okay. Miscellaneous advice for orphans um, seeking financial aid. Um, I would say, you know, when you complete your FAFSA application, um, you will select, you know, the, the box of orphan or ward of the court. It's not going to ask for any additional, you know, parent information. Um, same thing if you're applying to a, a CSS profile school. Um, and then typically, you know, the student might have quite a bit of demonstrated financial need. I would be in contact with those financial aid offices to um, understand more about the way that they meet need or how close they come to meet need if they don't meet um, full demonstrated need. Um, also, you know, be in contact with your, your guidance counselor at your school can walk you through um, uh, questions that you might have if you're on your own trying to figure that out, and then call the financial aid office. This is, you know, we this is why we do the work we do. We want to help students find the resources that they need to to go to college. So reach out to people. There are people that that can help you through that process. Is there any plan for me to join the tuition exchange program? Um, so that question's referring to um, exchange programs that um, colleges might offer to their own employees. So, um, and there are different programs out there. I would say to that one, um, it hasn't been on the table. I've been here for a little over five years. Um, I don't think that's something that we're looking at doing. Um, we have a generous one for our employees of sending we don't belong to any exchange programs basically so um so i i don't think that that's on the docket for um for reed to join any um of those programs um question about special circumstances do you contact the school first to ask and then fill out the application form or the other way around um i would look at their if they have a form some schools have a form online if they have the form and you feel good about answering it and it seems really clear to you and you feel like you're doing a good job telling them what's going on then i would do that if you have questions about the form how to do it to make sure that you're reporting it the right way 
um, then call them and ask them that you're looking at the form. You just want to make sure that you're doing this correctly that, and that they have the information they need to make a decision. Um, Reed's financial award provided more in grants and less in loans and work study than other schools. Can students take on additional work study and or direct loans beyond the award package? Um, the loan that we put in the package is the loan that you know, was used to meet your demonstrated need. And our goal at Reed, we wanna keep your loan low and we wanna keep the student work low. Your focus is to be focused on your academics and not worry about having to work um, as much as um, you might at another institution. Um, that said, you know, your federal loan eligibility are capped at a certain amount for a first year student. The most you can borrow um, in a federal loan is $5,500. Um, and we always would encourage you to only borrow what you need up to that amount. Um, and then as far as work study, we really want students to um, to stay in that work award. We do a work study award um, of $2,000 at Reed. And uh, that involves a student working, uh, next year it'll be about four to five hours a week on campus. And that's a really good amount given the, the rigorous academic program here. So we want students to not really work much more than that. Um, also, we want to have make sure that we are equitable and we have enough positions available to all students. So we really encourage supervisors to hire that student in order to get that work award. We're going to have a preference to a student with a work award. Um, that said, you could um, possibly find another position um, on campus, or if you're a domestic student, you certainly you know can look at work opportunities outside of campus as well. If a student is seeking a five-year degree program, is family contribution of tuition for five years? Um, so if that's um, like a 3-2 program, maybe um, that a college might offer where you do, let's say for Reed, we don't have an engineering program, but the student wants to do engineering. So they do three years at Reed and finish up the other two at a school with a devoted engineering program. Um, yes, it is the it's five years of expenses for a, for that type of a program, um, and in those kind of cases, a student would apply. Um, you know, three years they would do at Reed, Reed's financial aid, Reed's application process, etc., and then the subsequent years would be um, at that other school, and you would complete their eight, eight applications and get aid through that institution. Uh, when you talk about loans that are included in the OR package, are you talking about the federal student loans or a direct loan from Reed? Um, it's a federal, it's a federal loan. It's called a direct loan because it's direct through the federal government. So if you're a domestic student, you're going to have a federal direct student loan. So it's federally direct. Um, and direct, it comes from the federal government right to the student's account. So the money disperses onto the student account, goes towards the bill. Um, we do have, um, uh, for international students, they're not eligible to borrow a di federal direct loan. So we do have a REIT institutional loan program um, as well for international students. And I'm getting a message that that needed to be my last question. Um, oh, one more, I'm gonna sneak it in. Don't, do students have to live on campus all four years? Um, it depends on the college. Um, Reed does have a two-year residency requirement for freshmen and sophomores to live on campus, but that's going to be, that's going to vary college by college, so you want to check with that institution. So thank you so much. I would just say it's going to be okay. Just take a breath, um, ask questions. People are here to help you um, check back in. Um, if you have more questions with, you know, if you're working with Reed or other colleges, the admission staff, very knowledgeable about admissions and financial aid, and reach out to the aid offices and we'll help you through it. Okay. Thank you so much and everybody have a great rest of your day.